Chapter 1 Globes and Maps Until 1522, people were not sure about the shape of the earth. Most of the people thought that the earth was flat. They were afraid that they would fall down if they went too far in one direction. We should be grateful to Ferdinand Magellan who proved that the earth is round. Later, many other astronomers proved that the shape of the earth is round. Shape of the Earth Magellan was a courageous sailor and explorer. He led an expedition to prove that the earth is round. In 1519, Magellan sailed from a place called Seville in Spain with five ships. In 1522, one of his ships returned to the same place. This proved that the earth is round. The astronauts who have gone to space have also confirmed that the earth is spherical in shape. The earth is divided into continents and oceans. The extreme north and the extreme south points of the earth are called poles. These are known as the North Pole and the South Pole. Globe A globe is an exact model of the Earth. It represents the Earth in a simple and accurate way. It helps us to see the distribution of continents and oceans on the Earth. Drawbacks of a globe We cannot see the details of landforms locations of small town, etc. on a globe. We cannot see the entire earth at a time on it. Larger globes can show some details, but they are difficult to handle. It is also difficult to carry globes around. Do you know? The name Pacific Ocean was given by Ferdinand Magellan. Maps Maps are drawing of a part or the whole of the Earth's surface on a flat surface. They may represent a small area, a country, a continent or the entire world. The maps that depict small areas have greater detail, while the maps which show large areas generally depict only important locations or places. A collection of maps bound together in a book form is called an atlas. Some maps can be hung on the walls. They are called wall maps. They are available in many sizes. They are also used in a class to teach students. Types of maps Maps are mainly of two types, political and physical. The political maps depict political boundaries of countries, states and districts. The physical maps depict landforms and water bodies like mountains, plains, plateaus, valleys, rivers, seas and oceans. Apart from political and physical maps, there are also special maps. They show rainfall, vegetation, hills and mountains, rivers, oceans, ocean currents, railways, roadways, etc. Signs and Symbols It is difficult as well as inconvenient to use the pictures of monuments, rivers, mountains, etc. on the map. So, we use signs and symbols to represent them on the map. These signs and symbols are called the language of maps. For example, rivers, roadways, railways, temples and schools are all marked by a sign or a symbol on a map. These signs and symbols are also known as the conventional sign and symbols. Maps contain keys that help us understand these symbols. Colors on a map 
Apart from signs and symbols, different colors are used to represent different landforms and water bodies on the map. For example, plains are represented in green, deserts in yellow, while mountains and highlands are represented in brown. Oceans are represented in shades of blue. Directions and Scale Directions Directions play an important role in locating a place on the map. While locating a place, we sometimes move forward and sometimes backward. Sometimes we move to the left and at other times to the right. We need to move in the correct direction. Directions are very important to study maps. There are four main directions on a map. North, South, East and West. Top of the map is North. Bottom of the map is South. To our right is East and to our left is West. Apart from the main directions, there are four sub-directions. North-East, between North and East. South-East, between South and East. South-West, between South and West. North-West, between North and West. Scale Look at a map carefully. You can see a small ruler-like symbol on the maps. It is called scale. Why do we use scale on a map? It is not possible to show actual distances between places on maps. Therefore, they are represented by a smaller unit on the map. A scale is the ratio between the distance on the map and the real distance on the ground. Chapter 6 Greenland, the land of ice and snow You know that the area between the Arctic Circle and the North Pole comes in frigid zone. The region is also called the Tundra region. Let us study about the landscape, climate, wildlife, vegetation and the life of people in this region by taking the example of Greenland, the land of ice and snow. Greenland is the largest island. It lies in the northern polar region. Nuuk is the capital of Greenland. Location Greenland lies between the North Pole and the Arctic Circle to the northeast of Canada. Greenland is separated from the northern islands of Canada by the Baffin Bay and the Davis Strait. Neighboring countries Greenland shares its borders with the Atlantic Ocean in the southeast, the Greenland Sea in the east, the Arctic Ocean in the north and the Baffin Bay in the west. Iceland and Canada are the countries nearest to Greenland. Climate The climate of Greenland is extremely cold. It experiences cool summer and severely cold winter. More than 80% of the island is covered with thick ice. In summer, there is continuous sunlight for weeks at a stretch. It is therefore called the land of the midnight sun. Winters are extremely severe. The sun does not rise for many months. There is no sunlight during the days. It snows continuously and a strong cold wind blows at all times. The average temperature in Greenland ranges between minus 23 degrees Celsius in winter to 5 degrees Celsius in summer. In summer, when the snow melts, large blocks of melted ice called icebergs float away and get submerged in the ocean. They can cause great danger to the passing ships. Vegetation Due to extremely cold climate, there are few plants found here. Grass, shrubs and wild plants 
grow in the coastal areas. Currants, blueberries and cranberries also grow here. Lichens and mosses grow on the rocks and provide fodder for animals. Birch trees, willows, ferns and some herbs grow in the valleys of South Greenland. Wildlife Most of the animals found in Greenland have fur on their body to protect themselves from harsh winter. Some of the animals found in the island include reindeer, polar bear, caribou, mink, musk ox, arctic fox, arctic wolves and seals. Seabirds such as petrels, gulls and puffins are found in Greenland. Arctic tern, a small seabird, flies to Greenland in summer and migrates to the South Pole in winter. The sea around Greenland is home to many species of fish like trout, salmon and cod. Natural Resources Greenland is rich in natural resources. Lead and zinc are found in abundance. Uranium, copper and gold are also found here. Do you know? Huskies are wolf-like dogs found in Greenland. They are used for hunting and pulling sledge. Economy The main occupation of the people in Greenland is fishing. So the economy of the country depends upon fishing industry. Most of the country's income comes from the fishing industry. It also exports frozen tinned food and dried and smoked fish. Apart from fishes, the island also exports minerals like lead and zinc. Agriculture is practiced on a small scale in the southern part of the country. The people of southern Greenland also practice sheep farming. Transport Since most part of the country remains covered with thick sheets of ice, Wheeled vehicles are rare here. Sledges are the common mode of transportation in the island. People use them to travel from one place to another. These sledges are drawn by huskies or reindeers. Huskies are a type of dog. Modern means of transport are found in the coastal areas. Roads have been constructed in these parts of the island and motor vehicles are used. Kayak is a narrow boat made of wood and seal skin. It is used to catch fish. The umiak is a larger boat. Lifestyle The original inhabitants of Greenland are called Inuits. They live in snow houses called igloos. The igloos are dome-shaped houses with a single opening. The Inuits spread the skin of animals on the floor of their houses, which protects them from the severe climatic conditions. In summer, they live in tents made of the skin of animals. These tents are called tow pigs. The southwestern coast of Greenland is the warmest part and therefore it is the most populous part of the country. The people of Greenland use harpoons and automatic rifles to hunt seals, walrus and whales. They also catch fish. Fish forms an important part of their diet. They import a number of food items. As Greenland is a very cold place, people wear clothes made of fur to which hoods are attached. They keep their hands covered with mittens and wear large boots made of seal skin. Certain changes have also taken place in the lifestyle of the people of Greenland. Many of them work in cities, mines and oil fields. There are schools, hospitals and shopping centers.
people live in permanent houses. The capital city, Nuuk, previously known as Gotthab, is a modern city. It is an important center for processing fish. Fish is canned and exported all over the world. Chapter 7 Saudi Arabia, the land of the hot sun In the previous two chapters, you studied about the regions of hot and wet climate, the DRC, an extremely cold climate, Greenland. In this chapter, we will study about the regions of arid and dry climate with no or little vegetation. These regions are commonly known as desert regions. We will take the example of Saudi Arabia. Important Deserts of the World The Sahara and the Kalahari Deserts in Africa The Colorado and the Mexican Deserts in North America the Atacama Desert in South America, the Great Australian Desert in Australia, the Arabian and the Thar Deserts in Asia. Saudi Arabia is located in the Arabian Desert. It is the largest country of the Middle East. The capital of Saudi Arabia is Riyadh. Location most part of the Saudi Arabia is located in the Arabian Peninsula. Saudi Arabia has a long coastline. To its east is the Persian Gulf and to its west is the Red Sea. The Tropic of Cancer passes through the middle of Saudi Arabia. Plains and rugged mountains are located in the western part of the country. The central and eastern parts have dry deserts and plateaus. The southwestern region of Saudi Arabia has mountains and is known for its fresh climate. Do you know? The Rubal Khali, one of the largest sand deserts in the world, lies in the southern part of Saudi Arabia. Neighboring Countries Saudi Arabia has the following countries as its neighbors. Jordan and Iraq in the north and northeast, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates in the west, Oman in the southeast, Yemen in the south. Climate The climate of Saudi Arabia is hot and dry. During the day, the sun heats the sand, causing the day temperature to rise sharply. And at night, the sand cools very fast, causing the night temperature to drop. Therefore, the days are very hot and the nights are cool. Sandstorms are common in deserts. Strong winds carry sand from one place to another and form sand mounds called sand dunes. The shape of sand dunes changes with the direction of winds. Desert receives little or no rainfall. The coastal region of Saudi Arabia is humid throughout the year. However, the southwestern region receives rainfall due to a chain of steep mountains. Hill stations like Al Taif and Abha remain cool during summer. Vegetation Due to very low rainfall, the soil of South Arabia is not fertile. Less than 2% of the country's total area is arable land. Some important plants growing in the desert are cacti, thorny bushes and shrubs. These plants have long roots that go deep down in search of water. The stems of these plants are fleshy and store water. Leaves are reduced to thorns to prevent the loss of water. In some areas, melons, dates and tomatoes are also grown on a small scale. Wildlife Animals that can withstand the hot climate and loss of water are found here. Camel is known as the ship of the desert. They can stay without food and water for many days. They store water in their stomach 
and fat in their hum. Arabian horses and jackals move swiftly across the desert. Wolves and hyenas live in mountainous highlands. Pigeons and quails are seen near the oasis. In the coastal areas, flamingos and pelicans are a common sight. Natural Resources Saudi Arabia is very rich in crude oil. One-fifth of the total petroleum of the world is in Saudi Arabia and accounts for 40% of the country's income. Saudi Arabia is the largest exporter of oil. Oil is known as liquid gold. Some other minerals such as gold, silver, copper and zinc are also found here. It also exports platinum, chrome, titanium and precious stones. Economy The economy of Saudi Arabia largely depends on oil. It is the largest exporter of petroleum products in the world. Agriculture is done in a very limited area. Since there are no rivers or lakes in the country and also there is very little rainfall, water for irrigation comes by desalting the seawater. Some of the major crops are wheat, rice, alpha alpha and dates. Date palms also grow in oasis. Transport By using the money earned by selling petroleum, a good system of roads has been set up. A railway line has also been laid between Riyadh and the eastern seaport. International airports are located at Riyadh, Jeddah and Dharan. Jeddah is a busy seaport. Life of the people Before the development of the oil industry, most of the people led a nomadic life. Even today there are nomads who rear sheep and goats. They are known as Bedouins. They speak Arabic. They travel in groups across the desert and camp near an oasis. The traditional dress for men is a long white cotton gown called the thab and a headgear called ghutra. Women wear a gown called abaya and cover their faces with a veil. Dairy products, dates, rice and meat are the major food items of the people of Saudi Arabia. Fruits and green vegetables are also eaten. Tea and coffee are popular beverages. Most people in Saudi Arabia follow Islam. Two famous Islamic pilgrim centers, Mecca and Medina, are located in Saudi Arabia. Muslims from all over the world visit these places. People speak Arabic, which is also one of the official languages of the United Nations. The discovery of oil and export of petroleum have changed the life of the people of Saudi Arabia. People have taken to a western way of life. They are rich and they work with construction companies, petroleum refineries, fertilizers and steel and chemical industries. Modern cities with skyscrapers, latest facilities, schools, healthcare centers have emerged. Some of the important cities of Saudi Arabia include Riyadh and Jeddah. Chapter 8 The Grassland Prairies Grasslands are vast stretches of land covered with tall grasses and a few scattered trees. They are found in the regions which have either hot or cold climate marked with little rainfall. Grasslands cover more than one-fifth of the earth's land surface. In this chapter, we will study specially about the prairie grasslands. The grasslands are known by different names in different parts of the world. In North America,
Chapter 9 Pollution Pollution is the contamination of the environment by the discharge of harmful substances into the air, water or soil. The substances that cause pollution are called pollutants. By destroying the environment, we are damaging our own future. In this chapter, we will study about different types of pollution, their effects and the methods to keep a check on pollution. Types of Pollution There are mainly four types of pollutions. Air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution, noise pollution. Air pollution The contamination of air with harmful gases, suspended particles and other harmful substances is termed as air pollution. Causes of air pollution Most of the motor vehicles run on petrol or diesel. On burning of petrol and diesel, harmful gases like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide are released into air. These gases pollute the air. Industries release harmful smoke and gases in the air that contain poisonous chemicals. Forest fires, volcanic eruptions and sandstorm are some of the natural ways in which air gets polluted. Burning of firecrackers also harms the environment. Effects of air pollution Air pollution causes serious health problems like asthma, bronchitis, irritation in eyes, headache, and skin allergy. Air pollution is a major cause for acid rain. Such type of rain causes extensive damage to water, forest, soil resources, and even human health. When the heat of the sun can't escape the environment, the temperature of the earth increases. This is called greenhouse effect. In the long run, it leads to global warming. The climate of the earth is changing due to global warming. The pollutants in the air also have bad effect on monuments and buildings, especially those made with marble. They change the color of the marbles. Steps to control air pollution Filters should be installed in industries to control pollution. People should use smokeless chulhas, solar cookers and biogas in rural areas to reduce smoke caused due to burning of firewood. The use of lead-free petrol, diesel and CNG gas reduces the emission of the harmful gases in the environment. Emission from vehicles can also be reduced by properly maintaining them. Reforestation also helps in reducing air pollution. It is a process of restoring the forests that once existed but were cleared at some point of time in the past. Water Pollution When harmful substances or pollutants contaminate water bodies such as lakes, ponds, rivers and seas, they cause water pollution. Causes of water pollution Dumping of waste into rivers and seas by industries is the main cause of water pollution. Dumping of untreated sewage and garbage from urban and rural areas into water sources causes water pollution. Transportation of oil in the sea may sometimes cause oil spills. As a result, a layer of oil floats on the surface of water. This pollutes water and harms aquatic life. Effects of Water Pollution Consumption of polluted water leads to many waterborne diseases like dysentery, typhoid, jaundice and cholera. Water pollution causes harm to fish and other marine creatures. Water pollution also causes various other respiratory and skin infections. 
Steps to Control Water Pollution Sewage waste should be discharged in water only after treating it in the sewage treatment plants. Industrial wastes should be properly treated before being dumped in water. Soil Pollution The demand for food has grown up manifold due to the ever-increasing population. To get a higher yield, fertilizers, insecticides and pesticides are used. The overuse of these chemical substances pollutes the soil. Causes of Soil Pollution Excessive use of pesticides, fertilizers and chemicals. Contaminated surface water pollutes the upper surface of soil. Oil and fuel dumping on the soil. Waste from mines and landfills. Discharge of industrial waste into the soil. Effects of soil pollution. Organisms present in the soil are badly affected by pesticides and insecticides. These organisms are the important components of soil ecosystem. Excessive use of chemicals decreases the fertility of the soil. Increased pollutants in soil are harmful to the growth of crops. Steps to control soil pollution Certain wastes like plastic, iron, tin, glass, etc. should not be dumped in the soil. They can be recycled to make new items. Fertilizers and pesticides should be judiciously used. The excretory wastes can be used to prepare biogas. Clean and well-covered dustbins should be used to throw garbage. Soil erosion should be prevented by growing grass and small plants. Noise pollution Increase in level of unwanted sound in the environment is termed as noise pollution. Sources of noise pollution Industrial activities and motor vehicles are the main sources of noise pollution. Unnecessary honking of horns on the road by automobiles and the sound of running trains cause noise pollution. Effects of noise pollution Loud noise may result in the loss of hearing in people. Sudden increase in noise can have adverse effect on heart and blood pressure. Noise pollution can cause insomnia. Steps to Control Noise Pollution Proper maintenance and lubrication of machines helps to reduce noise pollution. Machines that produce less sound should be used or else they should be run in soundproof halls. Factories should be away from residential areas. Blowing of horns on the roads should be banned. Trees should be planted alongside the roads to reduce noise pollution. Chapter 10 Saving the Environment Everything present around us together constitutes our environment. It includes human beings, animals and plants as living beings and air, water, soil, sunlight etc as non-living beings. All these things are called the components of environment. In this chapter, we will study about the importance of environment, effects of human activities on environment and steps to save environment. Degradation in Environment Human beings are the most intelligent creatures on the earth. Only they are capable of bringing changes in the environment. Therefore, human activities are alone responsible for the degradation in environment. The overuse of resources has polluted soil and land, water and air, and depleted natural resources like forests, water, coal, oil 
and minerals. Many species of plants and animals have become extinct or have largely reduced in number. How to save our environment? We have to adopt environment-friendly methods in our day-to-day -day activities to save our earth. We should celebrate one Mahotsav or forest fair and plant trees. We should celebrate festivals like Diwali without bursting crackers as they cause air and noise pollution. We should not use plastic polythene bags as they harm the environment. We should always try to use cloth bags. We should not throw waste or garbage in an open area, on road or other public places. We should always dispose of garbage in garbage bins. We should not let water collect in our locality as it becomes a breeding ground for mosquitoes. This could cause diseases. Wastes Unwanted and unusable things are called wastes. There are three types of wastes. Solid waste, liquid waste and gaseous waste. Solid waste Solid wastes include garbage from homes, hospitals, offices, marketplaces, etc. in the form of waste papers, plastic, broken furniture, bottles, rags, newspapers, vegetables and fruit peels. Liquid Waste Sewage and industrial effluents are examples of liquid wastes. Gaseous Waste Smoke, dust, carbon monoxide and other harmful gases form gaseous waste. Biodegradable and non-biodegradable wastes The waste can also be classified as biodegradable and non-biodegradable wastes. Biodegradable wastes The waste that decomposes easily and gets mixed with the soil is called biodegradable waste. The examples of biodegradable waste include all natural substances like vegetables, fruits and leftover food. Non-biodegradable waste The waste that does not decompose like plastics, glass, metal pieces etc. are called non-biodegradable wastes. These wastes remain in the environment for longer period and pollute it. Disposal of Wastes Waste generation cannot be stopped. In fact, the quantity of waste is increasing day by day. To get rid of the harmful effects of waste, there should be a proper waste management system. It includes collection, transportation, treatment or processing, recycling, or disposal and monitoring of waste materials. Waste materials can be disposed of in certain ways given on the next page. Dumping In many cities, solid wastes are dumped in an open area in the outskirts. However, such a practice can be dangerous for the environment and for our health too. Landfill in landfilling, deep ditches are dug. Solid wastes are dumped in them and spread out evenly with the help of bulldozers. Once these ditches are full, they are covered by soil. Burning In this method, solid wastes are collected in one place and burnt. This method converts waste material into heat, gas, steam and ash. The practice is generally followed in countries where land is scarce. Composting Making compost out of the biodegradable waste is one of the best ways 
to get rid of wastes. The process of compost making involves filling a pit with biodegradable waste materials and covering the pit with soil. After some time, the waste gets decomposed and we get compost out of it. Rich in nutrients, compost are used as natural fertilizers and are beneficial for the soil. 3 R's Another important way of getting rid of waste is to follow the rule of the 3 R's. Reduce, Recycle and Reuse The process of recycling involves processing waste materials into new products. Many waste materials like metallic cans, glassware and paper can be recycled into new products. These products can be reused. A number of one-time use items have become a part of our daily life. We give rise to a lot of waste when we dispose them. This quantity can be reduced by using their substitutes. For example, if we use cloth napkins instead of paper napkins, we can reduce waste to a great extent. Chapter 11 Natural Disasters Natural disasters are certain natural activities that cause a great loss to life, property and environment. Earthquake, flood, volcanic eruption, tsunami, cyclone and drought are examples of natural disasters. In this chapter, we will study about earthquake, flood, cyclone and droughts. Earthquake Earthquake is the most devastating and unpredictable disaster. The sudden vibrations or shaking of the earth's surface is called an earthquake. Earthquakes are caused due to disturbances beneath the earth's surface. They can cause great harm by toppling buildings and houses and breaking bridges and dams. They can cause great loss to property and human lives. Sometimes, earthquakes also occur under the sea or ocean bed. This results in giant water waves called tsunami. They have great power and energy and destroy everything in their path. The 2004 tsunami which arose in the Indian Ocean caused great destruction to life and property. During an earthquake, the point of disturbance under the earth's surface is called an epicenter. It is the center of an earthquake. From the epicenter, vibrations travel to the surface of the earth. The point on the surface just above the epicenter is called focus. From the focus, these vibrations travel to different places on the earth depending on the intensity of the earthquake. A seismograph is an instrument that measures the intensity of an earthquake. The magnitude of an earthquake is measured on the Richter scale. A seismic zone is an area which has a high risk of earthquakes. In India, the Himalayan region is prone to earthquakes as it lies in the seismic zone. Safety measures The houses constructed in the areas Prone to earthquakes should be earthquake resistant. When an earthquake strikes, people should move out to open spaces. They should stay away from any kind of solid structures, lamp posts and electric transformers. If stuck inside a house during an earthquake, one should take shelter under a table or desk. Apartments should have emergency exits. People should move out through these exits and avoid elevators. Flood Flood is overflowing of water which submerges the land. It is the most common natural disaster. It occurs when the volume of water in a water body such as river or lake overflows its usual boundaries. This happens 
when an area receives excessive rainfall or when a great quantity of snow melts increasing the water level in the water bodies floods can also be caused due to landslides strong tides storms at sea cyclones and tsunamis sometimes the stagnant flood water causes an outbreak of diseases they may spread rapidly taking the shape of epidemics safety measures before flood one should know how to reach the nearest safe shelters in rural areas elevated areas should be identified a first aid kit with important medications should be kept ready in flood prone areas an emergency kit with strong ropes for tying things a radio torch and spare batteries stocks of fresh water dry food salt and sugar kerosene candles and match boxes waterproof bags to store clothing and valuables and umbrellas and bamboo sticks should be kept ready at homes trees should be planted as they form natural barriers against water in a flood prone area channels should be created and maintained in working condition all the time so that excess water can be drained off during flood warnings related to flood are regularly broadcast on radio and relayed on tv people should watch out for all such news reports all electrical appliances should be kept switched off during a flood one should move to upper levels of buildings and wait to be evacuated one should not try to wade through the flood water cyclone coastal areas often face the fury of cyclones a cyclone is a very strong wind accompanied by very heavy rainfall cyclones usually occur between 5 degrees to 20 degrees latitude north and south of the equator they are called by different names in different parts of the world cyclone hurricane typhoon and vilivili in india coastal states such as west bengal odisha andhra pradesh and tamil nadu along the bay of bengal and gujarat and maharashtra along the arabian sea have frequent cyclones weather bulletins and warnings regarding cyclones feature regularly on radio and television and people are moved to safer places fishermen boats people living in coastal areas telephone and electricity poles and trees are most affected by cyclones safety measures in coastal areas people should keep a watch on the cyclone alerts on radio and television people living in cyclone prone areas should identify safe shelters in their area and the shortest and safest routes to reach these places an emergency kit should always be kept ready if a warning for cyclone has been issued people should listen to the tv or radio for further reports one should close all doors and windows and stay indoors if a warning for cyclone has been sounded people should not venture into the sea or ocean It is important for people to move to safer places. Contact numbers of emergency services, family and friends should be kept handy. Droughts. When a particular region receives very little or no rainfall, conditions of drought prevail. It is a condition of acute scarcity of water, food and fodder. due to scanty rainfall the indian states of rajasthan and gujarat face frequent droughts due to less rainfall other states such as andhra pradesh chatisgarh jharkhand central maharashtra interior karnataka parts of tamil nadu and bihar also face drought conditions frequently prevention of droughts trees help in percolation of water 
as well as they bring rainfall. Therefore, trees should be planted in drought-prone areas. All these areas have inadequate water. Rainwater harvesting will help in tackling drought conditions. People should use water wisely. Drought-resistant crops such as millets, maize and sorghum should be grown. Chapter 12 Spreading Knowledge You have already studied that early humans did not spend their life much better than the animals. It was the knowledge that human beings gathered by observing the ongoing activities in nature and made their lives different from the animals. With the passage of time, more and more knowledge got added to the human brain and the life of man became much better than that of animals. In this chapter, you will study how knowledge spreads from one person to another or one region to another. The early human beings did not know any language. They used certain signs to express their thoughts. The Native Americans used smoke signals to communicate with each other. Some African tribes took the help of drum beats to communicate. Then, human beings started drawing pictures on walls, stones and clay tablets. Pigeons were also used to carry messages to far-off lands. Over a period of time, horsemen were trained to move from place to place and convey messages. Earliest Written Records Since the humans did not know how to write, they drew pictures on the walls of caves and rocks in order to keep written records. This form of communication is called pictographic communication. These pictures depicted their actions, feelings and thoughts. The Sumerians of Mesopotamia were the first to develop the art of writing about 3000 BCE. The Egyptians developed a script which is called the hieroglyphics. The script was based on picture which conveyed meanings. For example, the picture of a man shooting at an animal indicated hunting. The pictures and signs took the forms of letters as time passed. The Egyptians made 24 letters from the pictures. Script Gradually, pictures were replaced by symbols. The Sumerians made wedge-shaped symbols on wet clay tablets, which were later hardened by baking. This form of writing came to be known as the cuneiform script. A script is a form of writing. The Greek and Roman alphabets were derived from these scripts. The same scripts paved the way for the development of the English language. The Indus Valley Civilization had its own script, but this script has not been understood yet. Later, the Brahmi script was developed. Much later, the Devanagari script came into existence. Many modern Indian languages use the Devanagari script. The South Indian languages have their own Dravidian script. Invention of Paper The early humans wrote on stones and clay tablets which were inconvenient to take to other places. So, they were looking for an alternate material to be used for writing and keeping records. This led to the invention of paper. The Egyptians made paper by beating the leaves of the papyrus plant into thin strips. Sai Lun, a Chinese scholar, is credited with the invention of paper as we get it in its present form. The Chinese made paper from certain plants that could be broken down into fibers and pressed into sheets. The Arabs learned the art of making paper and spread the knowledge to the Western countries. Invention of Printing Earlier, people used manuscripts or handwritten records to keep information. These records were greatly valued as they were handwritten. 
only limited copies of such records were available which were accessible to a few. The invention of printing press made the production of many copies of books possible. So, books were now available to many more people. Printing was first introduced to the world by the Chinese. They cut patterns on wooden blocks, dipped these blocks in ink and pressed them on paper to get the impression of the patterns. Nearly thousand years later, in the 15th century, Johannes Gutenberg set the first printing press in Germany. The first book printed was the Bible in 1456. 200 copies of the Bible were printed on sheepskin. Braille Louis Braille was a blind French student. He developed a script called the Braille for people who could not see. The Braille script consists of raised dots on paper which are read by touching. You can see Braille script on the next page. Origin of Numbers After the early humans became producers by inventing agriculture, they started living at one place. They also domesticated animals. Gradually, many other fields of occupation started. This led to the maintenance of records and there arose a need to count. Initially, human beings used stones, sticks and pebbles to count things but were soon replaced by dots, strokes or symbols. Number systems originated in different forms at different places of the world. Indians made a very significant contribution by giving the world the concept of zero. Mathematics was well developed in India. It is believed that people counted on their ten fingers and this led to the development of the decimal system. The Arabs passed on the knowledge of numbers to the West. The Chinese used abacus to keep records. Chapter 13 Communication Communication means exchange of information or ideas between people, the earliest form of communication involved the use of signs, sounds and gestures. Let us read about some common means of communication that we use today. Letters Earlier, messengers carried messages and letters from one place to another. As it took a long time, they were replaced by horsemen who moved faster. In the 19th century, postal service was set up. In our country, every big neighborhood in the cities and almost every big village has a post office. To send a letter, we drop it into the red color letter box. These are then collected and sent to post offices. In post offices, they are sorted out and sent to their respective addresses. Parcels and money orders are also sent through post offices. To cover the cost of postage, stamps of certain amounts are affixed on letters, parcels and envelopes. Letters, parcels and envelopes reach their destination by railways, roadways and airways. Until a few years back, Urgent messages were sent through telegrams. Now, the government has stopped this service due to its decreasing popularity. Telephone Telephone is the most popular means of personal communication. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in the year 1876. People could talk to each other over long distances by simply dialing a number. Today, we have mobile phones which also enable us to send messages, connect to the internet, read and write emails and even find the location of places. A fax machine scans and helps to send documents through telephone wires. Documents can be transmitted to distance places through the fax machines. Email the Internet enables us to send and receive emails 
and stay in touch with our friends and relatives living all over the world mass media when an idea is communicated to many people at the same time it is known as mass communication the tools of mass media include radio television internet books newspapers and magazines books newspapers and magazines are available in many languages they keep us informed of all the national and international events and happenings people also use this medium to advertise for their products and services advertisement is a dominant form of communication which tells us about products and services radio is a wireless communication device invented by marconi we listen to the radio for news songs educational and entertainment programs the television was invented by john logie bard we watch news films advertisements and other entertainment programs on the television today internet is a major source of information on almost every topic satellite moon is the natural satellite of the earth it revolves around the earth all the time it gave an idea to our scientists to project a man made object fitted with communication system in the space since the earth is round sending radio and television signals around the world was a problem this new idea solved the problem the machines sent by scientists into the space are called artificial satellites artificial satellites orbit the earth and play an important role in modern communication they pick up signals from the earth and these signals are sent back to the earth without any loss of time as a result television programs are telecast and we are able to see news reports or live telecast of any event taking place elsewhere in the world weather satellites help in forecasting weather conditions forecast of cyclones floods and storms help the authorities evacuate people and save lives Chapter 14 Transport You know that the invention of wheel was a turning point in the field of transport It gave a proper shape and direction to the modern transport system Another turning point came in the field of transport with the invention of steam engine With the passage of time many other inventions took place in the field of transport In this chapter We will discuss different modes of transport. Modes of transport. Modes of transport can be grouped into roadways, railways, waterways and airways. Roadways. Earlier there were only kachcha roads, but in our age most of the cities are connected by pakka roads made of tar. However, There are still kachcha roads in many villages in our country. Cities have pakka motorable roads. Some motorable roads are also called highways, freeways and expressways. These are broad roads with four or six lanes and they connect cities and towns with each other. Sometimes these roads also connect two countries. The Grand Trunk Route connects Kolkata in India to Peshawar in Afghanistan. India has one of the largest network of roads in the world. It measures over 35000 kilometers. The longest highway in India is NH7 which connects Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh to Kanyakumari in Tamil Nadu. Railways Railways were introduced in India in 1853 by the British. The first train in India ran between Thane and Mumbai. India has the second largest network of railways in the world 
running about 70,000 kilometers. For smooth functioning, the Indian railway network is divided into several zones. Today, metro trains run in Delhi, Kolkata, Mumbai, Bengaluru and Jaipur. Trams also form a part of Kolkata's transport system. Many people travel by local trains in some cities like Chennai and Mumbai. Monorail has also been started in Mumbai. Superfast air-conditioned trains called the Rajdhani Express and the Shatabdi Express connect many Indian cities. Passenger trains carry people while goods trains carry raw material and finished products from place to place. The Grand Orient Express connects Paris in France with Istanbul in Turkey. The United States of America has the largest network of railways in the world. The fast trains in Japan are called bullet trains. These trains run at a speed of 400 kilometers per hour. In mountainous regions, rail routes are constructed through tunnels as well. The Seikan Tunnel in Japan is the longest railway tunnel in the world. Tunnels for railways have also been built through seas. Through the English Channel, a rail tunnel connects England and France. Do you know? The Trans-Siberian Railway or Trans-Siberian Railroad in Russia is the longest rail route connecting Leningrad to Vladivostok. Its length is about 9,500 kilometers. Waterways Rafts and canoes were the most ancient means of water transport. These modes were followed by boats and ships sailing with the help of wind. The Romans built ships with several tiers called galleys. After the invention of steam engine, ships started running on steam engines. This made travel faster. Today, luxury liners, freighters and tankers carry people and goods. The luxury liners provide all comforts to the passengers. Oil tankers carry oil to all parts of the world. Freighters carry heavy loads of food, timber and machinery. Cargo vessels are also used to carry heavy cargo from one port to another. Waterways are of great importance to a country. They require low maintenance and are by far the cheapest means of travel. A port city is one which has a port. It connects a country to the rest of the world through waterways. Import and export of goods also take place through these ports. There are 13 major ports in India. More than half of the country's Foreign trade takes place on western shores at the Mumbai port. Important Sea Routes The Suez Canal was built in 1869, connecting the port of Suez on the Red Sea to the port, Said on the Mediterranean Sea. Before this canal, ships had to sail all around the continent of Africa to reach the other side. Once ships started sailing through the Suez Canal, Sea travel from London to Mumbai was reduced from six months to two weeks. The Panama Canal connects the Pacific Ocean with the Atlantic Ocean. The North Atlantic route between London and New York is the busiest and the most important sea route. The South Atlantic route between Europe and South America is also important. The inland waterways have their own significance. River Huanghu in China, Rhine and Danube rivers in Europe and the Nile and Congo rivers in Africa are used for transportation. Among the Indian rivers, Ganga and Brahmaputra rivers are navigable. The backwaters of Kerala are also navigable. Airways Airways came into being with the invention of aeroplane by the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur. The first aeroplane was called the Flyer. We have come a long way since the first plane. Today, aeroplanes are well equipped to carry as many as 
four hundred passengers. They fly at a great speed. They cover long distances in less time. Aeroplanes are the fastest and the most expensive means of travel. They land and take off at airports. The popular airports of the world are Heathrow in London, Kennedy in New York, and De Gaulle in Paris. Some of the international airports in India are Indira Gandhi International Airport in Delhi, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose International Airport in Kolkata, Anna International Airport in Chennai, and Chhatrapati Shivaji International Airport. In Mumbai, the important air companies of the world include the Trans World Airlines, United Airlines, Royal Dutch Airlines, British Airways, Lufthansa, Aeroflot, and Alitalia Airlines. In India, Air India is run by the government. Some private airlines like Indigo, SpiceJet. Kingfisher and Jet Airways also offer air travel. Chapter Fifteen: Medical Science. In the ancient times, people used medicinal plants to cure diseases. This system of medication is still existing in our country. It is called Ayurveda. In different parts of the world, different forms of medication were in use. Many of them are still existing, like homeopathy, acupressure, acupuncture, etc. However, these systems of medication have some limitations. They cannot act instantly. Besides, they do not talk about surgical method of medication. But the modern medical science has made a tremendous progress. Now we know how diseases occur. Thousands of medicines have been developed. Today, many kinds of crucial surgeries are possible. All these developments have made our life healthier. Let us study how these developments took place. Contribution to medical science. Circulation of blood. William Harvey was an English physician who, in 1628, discovered. The circulation of blood in the human body. He is known as the father of modern physiology. Clinical thermometer. A clinical thermometer is used to measure body temperature. It was invented by Daniel Fahrenheit, a German physicist, in 1715. A clinical thermometer is a slim glass rod with a bulb of mercury at one end. It is marked with degrees. From 95 degrees Fahrenheit to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, it also has a Celsius scale. 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit is taken as the normal body temperature. If the body temperature is higher or lower than the normal body temperature, we know that a person is not well. Today, digital thermometers are also available. The body temperature is taken by placing the thermometer in the patient's mouth or under the armpit. The mercury in the bulb heats up and expands due to body heat. The extent to which the mercury rises indicates the body temperature. Stethoscope. A stethoscope is a medical device used to listen to the sounds of the internal body organs such as lungs and heart. It was invented by Dr. Rene Lenac in 1816. By using this device, doctors identify if there is any problem in the functioning of the body organs. The stethoscopes used these days are far more advanced and very sensitive. Microscope. A microscope is an instrument that enables us to see very minute objects. Which cannot be seen through naked eyes by enlarging their size. A Dutch optician named Zacharias Janssen invented a light microscope in 1590. However, a Dutch scientist called Anton van Leeuwenhoek is known as the father of microscope. Medical imaging. 
The X-ray was invented by a German physicist, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, in 1895. An X-ray machine enables us to take images from inside the human body. It helps in diagnosis of any rupture or fracture in the bones. The MRI, magnetic resonance imaging machine, uses a powerful magnetic field to obtain the images of the internal parts of the body. The ECG, electrocardiography machine, plots the heartbeats in the form of a graph. The ultrasound machine uses ultrasound to detect problems in the internal organs of the body. Laser. These days, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation or laser saves the patients from surgery in many cases. Laser is a narrow beam of high intensity light that can travel long distances without getting dispersed. Laser treatment destroys the diseased tissues and helps to heal the affected parts. Antibiotics Alexander Fleming, a British scientist, discovered penicillin, the first antibiotic, in 1928. He discovered this drug while conducting a research on bacteria. Over time, many more antibiotics have been discovered that are used today to cure several diseases. Vaccination The credit of inventing first vaccine goes to Edward Jenner. He invented first vaccine against smallpox in 1776. Today we have vaccination for a number of diseases like tuberculosis, cholera, tetanus, typhoid, whooping cough and yellow fever. Pasteurization Louis Pasteur, a French chemist, discovered that disease-causing germs were present in water and milk. Boiling them for half an hour killed the germs. The method of killing of germs by boiling milk followed by its rapid cooling is called pasteurization. Sterilization Sterilization means protection against infection. First antiseptic was discovered by Joseph Lister, an English surgeon. He used carbolic acid for dressing wounds to control and reduce infection. Robert Koch, a German scientist, found that exposure to steam killed germs. He advocated sterilizing surgical instruments and dressings by steaming them. Surgery The cutting open of the body to treat an injury or disease is called surgery. The doctors who perform surgery are called surgeons. They use medical equipments like scissors, scalpel, saw, needle and forceps for the operation. Surgeries enable surgeons to replace vital body organs like the kidney, liver and the heart. Major surgical operations are conducted on the brain and heart. A recent development in the field of surgery is laser surgery. This form of surgery uses laser rays for treatment and does not require the use of knife or scalpel. Anesthesia Before performing a surgery, a surgeon applies anesthesia so that the patient does not feel any pain During the operation, the medicine used in anesthesia is chloroform. Chloroform Chloroform was discovered by Dr. James Young Simpson. He introduced its use in surgery. Good habits to lead a healthier life. Medical science has no doubt given solution for various diseases. However, it is important to follow some basic rules to lead a healthy life. We should keep our surroundings clean. We should eat nutritious food. We should eat food rich in vitamins and minerals. We should not skip meals. We should walk and exercise daily. We should boil water and milk before drinking. Chapter 16 Great People of the World How does one become a great person? 
a person who works for the welfare of other people without any selfish motive becomes great out of the millions and millions of people in the world there are only a few who become great they may be rulers religious leaders social workers scientists politicians or others who improve the lives of the people by their teachings or work they make a special place in the heart of people and inspire them let us know about some such people george washington george washington the first president of usa was born on 22nd february 1732 in westmoreland county virginia in the united states he was a great military leader he was elected the commander in chief of the continental army in 1775 during the american war of independence against the british in 1789 george washington was elected the first president of the united states he was reelected in 1792 He played a significant role in the American Revolution and then in the formation of the United States after independence. He died on 14 December 1799. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was born in a poor family in Kentucky in the year 1809. He became the 16th president of the United States of America. His father was a poor farmer. The family suffered many hardships and therefore Lincoln could not attend school regularly. Despite the adverse conditions, Lincoln grew up to become the president of the United States of America in 1861. During his presidency, the northern and southern states fought the civil war over the issue of slavery. The northern states won the war. Lincoln opposed slavery. He brought out the Emancipation Proclamation in effect from 1863 which freed the slaves. He was elected president for the second time in 1865. However, he was killed on 14th April 1865. William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was a great English poet and playwright. He was born in Stratford upon Avon on 23rd April 1564. At the age of 18, Shakespeare married Annie Hathaway, who was a farmer's daughter. After a few years, he went to London and joined a theatre society. He grew very popular and soon became one of the city's leading actors and playwrights. By the year 1594, Six of his plays were put up on stage. In 1599, Shakespeare along with six others purchased the Globe Theatre, one of the largest theatres in London. He died in 1616. His works include about 38 plays and several poems. His plays have been translated into every major language. Some of his plays include A Midsummer Night's Dream comedy of errors twelfth night as you like it and the merchant of venice martin luther king jr martin luther king jr was one of the greatest leaders of the american civil rights movement he was born in atlanta in 1929 though slavery was abolished from the united states the dark skinned people were still treated badly He fought for equal rights for all dark-skinned people. His efforts gathered a large number of supporters and finally a law was passed which gave equal rights to the dark-skinned people of America. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was born on 26th August 1910 in Yugoslavia. Her real name was Agnes Gonza Bozagsio. She completed her education at the age of 18 and decided to become a Catholic nun. In 1929, she arrived in India and started teaching in various schools. However, she was greatly moved by the plight of the poor. 
she worked for them and gave them food and medicines she dedicated her life to the service of the poorest of the poor with a mission to care for needy and sick people mother teresa established the missionaries of charity in 1950 in calcutta which is now kolkata she set up an orphanage called nirmal hriday she also started leprosy centers today the missionaries of charity runs orphanages and hospitals worldwide mother teresa received the nobel prize in 1979 and the bharat ratna in 1980 she utilized all the awarded money to serve the poor she died on 5th september 1997 she was proclaimed a saint by the vaticans wolfgang amadeus mozart born on 27 january 1756 Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was a great musician. He died at an early age of 35. However, he composed over 600 works, many of which are masterpieces. He showed his musical talent from a very early age. He started composing from the age of 5, and by 17, he was the court musician of Salzburg in Austria. He spent many years of his life in Vienna. where he composed many of his famous compositions his opera the magic flute is considered one of the greatest of all times leonardo da vinci leonardo da vinci was a great painter sculptor architect musician scientist mathematician engineer inventor geologist cartographer and writer Apart from other qualities, Leonardo da Vinci is considered one of the greatest painters. His painting The Mona Lisa is one of the most famous paintings of the world. He studied the flight of birds and designed parachutes and flying machines. He compiled an atlas of muscles, bones and organs of human body. Despite the lack of his formal education in science, His work in astronomy, anatomy and engineering was far ahead of his time. Chapter 17 Gems of India Our motherland has produced many great people. They have contributed a lot to different fields of human welfare. It is their immense dedication towards their work that India has become one of the most admirable countries in the world. Let us read about the lives of a few such great personalities. Sushruta Sushruta was a great surgeon of ancient India. Born in 6th century BCE, he is believed to be the descendant of Vedic sage Vishwamitra. He learned surgery and medicine at Varanasi and became a famous surgeon. He was an expert in removing urinary stones. locating and treating fractures and operating eyes for removing cataract he was an excellent teacher he told his pupils that in order to become a good doctor one should have practical and theoretical knowledge of the subject he wrote the famous shushruta samhita a sanskrit text on major concepts of ayurvedic medicines with chapters on surgery charaka Charaka was the son of a sage. He was born in 300 BCE and is considered to be one of the greatest contributors to the system of medicine developed in ancient India. He believed that it was more important to prevent the occurrence of a disease than to seek its cure. He was of the opinion that one needed to study all the factors including environment which influenced a patient's disease. before prescribing treatment charaka was the first physician to present the concept of digestion charaka studied the anatomy of the human body and its various organs he also knew the fundamentals of genetics charaka also wrote the charak samhita a standard work on the subject it was translated into many foreign languages including arabic and latin kalidas Kalidas was one of the nine gems or navratna of the court of the Chandragupta Vikramaditya. 
the famous ruler of the Gupta dynasty. He was India's greatest dramatist and poet. Kalidas is known as the Shakespeare of India. Some of his well-known works include Abhigyana Shakuntalam, Meghdutam, Ritu Samhara and Kumar Sambhav. His works have been translated into many languages. Rani Lakshmi Bai Rani Lakshmi Bai was one of the most courageous and brave Indian rebellions of 1857. She was born in Varanasi in 1835 and married to the king of Jhasi. But she had to escape from the city when the British forces laid siege to Jhasi. Although she gave a tough resistance against them, but her army was defeated. Later, Lakshmi Bai and Tantya Tope combined their forces and defeated the army of the Maharaja of Gwalior and occupied a strategic fort. Rani Lakshmi Bai died on 17th June 1858 battling the British at Gwalior. Rabindranath Tagore The composer of our national anthem Janagana Man, Rabindranath Tagore was born on 7th May 1861 at Jora Sanko. He is regarded as one of the greatest poets of India. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He started writing poems at a young age. He became a renowned writer who wrote poems, stories and articles. His collection of poems, the Gitanjali, is read widely. He opened a school called Shantiniketan. He did not believe in classroom education. So classes were, and still are, held in the lap of nature in the open. At Shantiniketan, children were provided free education and free food. The British conferred upon him the title of knighthood. But he gave it up in protest against the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. He established a national university called the Vishwa Bharati in 1918. His works were translated into many languages. He died in 1941 at the age of 80. Mahatma Gandhi The full name of Mahatma Gandhi was Mohan Das Karamchand Gandhi. He was born on 2nd October 1869 at Porbandar in Gujarat. His father, Karamchand Gandhi, was the Diwan of Rajkot. His mother, Putli Bai, was a religious lady. He studied law in England and soon got an opportunity to go to South Africa to fight a case for an Indian businessman. South Africa at that time was ruled by a white government which followed the policy of apartheid. Gandhiji decided to fight against this. He mobilized people and organized protests based on the ideals of non-violence and satyagraha. The South African government was forced to withdraw their policy of apartheid due to Gandhiji's protest. In 1915, Gandhiji returned to India. Indians were then ruled by the British. Gandhiji lost no time to pick up the cause of Indian freedom movement. He toured all parts of the country, meeting people and inviting them to join the freedom struggle. He used his famous technique of truth, non-violence and non-cooperation. He asked people to disobey the laws of the British and not to use goods and clothes manufactured by the British. Finally, the British had to leave India in 1947. On 15th August 1947, India became a free nation. People lovingly called him Bapu. Ravindranath Tagore gave him the title of Mahatma. He is known as the father of the nation. On 30th January 1948, when Mahatma Gandhi was going for his prayer meeting, he was shot dead by Nathu Ram Godse. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was one of the most respected social reformers of India. He started the movement for the spread of modern education among the Muslims. He spread English education among the Muslims. He founded the Translation Society at Aligarh, which was later renamed as the Scientific Society. 
His greatest achievement was the setting up of the Anglo Oriental College at Aligarh, which is today known as the Aligarh Muslim University. Ravi Shankar Whenever we talk about Indian instrumental musicians, the name of Ravi Shankar comes the first. He was born in 1920 in Varanasi, Uttar Pradesh. He was a great sitar player and a good dancer. He was the first Indian instrumentalist to tour the world in 1956. He established the Kinnar School of Music in Mumbai. One of his best known students was George Harrison, a member of the pop music group Beatles. In 1969, he published his autobiography My Music, My Life. He has been awarded the Bharat Ratna, the highest honor in the country. He has also received three Grammy Awards, one of the most prestigious awards in the field of music. He died on December 11, 2012 at California, USA. M.S. Subbulakshmi M.S. Subbulakshmi was born on 16 September 1916 in Madurai. She was a renowned Carnatic vocalist. She gave her first public performance at the age of 13. She was awarded the highest civilian award, Bharat Ratna. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru called her the Queen of Music. M.S. Subulakshmi died on 11 December 2004. Chapter 18 The British Rule and the Revolt of 1857 India was a very rich country in the ancient time. In fact, it was called the Golden Bird. The story of its richness was spread far and wide. When the Arabs heard about it, they established trade relations with India. They were the first to establish trade relations with India. They traded in spices textile and pearls. Gradually, the Europeans also heard about it and decided to have a trade link with India. But with the passage of time, the motive of Europeans changed and they captured many parts of India. In this chapter, you will study how the Europeans came and established their rule in many parts of India. Besides, you will also study how the native people revolted against them. The first European in India The first European to find a sea route to India was the Portuguese Vasco da Gama. He went around Africa and located Calicut in Kerala in 1498. The British East India Company came to India with the intention of trading in spices, cotton and silk cloth, medicines, perfumes, precious stones and metals. Eventually, the British gained a strong foothold by defeating the Portuguese, Dutch and French. 
they set up big trading centers at Surat, Bombay or Mumbai, Midras, a Chennai, and Calcutta, Kolkata, and turned them into forts. Though the British was earning a good amount of money from the trade, yet their greediness increased day by day. They started misusing the facilities granted by the Mughal rulers to make even more profit. When Sirajuddola, the Nawab of Bengal, protested against the British ways of trading, they started a war against him in 1757. This war is known as the Battle of Plassey. The Nawab of Bengal was defeated. In 1764, the East India Company started another war against the combined armies of Nawabs of Bengal and Awadh and the Mughal Emperor. This was called the Battle of Baksar. They won the war and obtained the right to collect revenue in Bengal. This made the company very powerful. After spending much time in India, they noticed that there was no unity among the Indian rulers. They were in fact fighting with each other. The British took advantage of this situation and applied the policy of divide and rule. The use of this policy helped them to capture a number of kingdoms. They gradually extended their power in other parts of India. However, there were a few powerful kingdoms like the Marathas, Punjab and Mysore who did not give in to the British. The British fought many wars against them and ultimately defeated them. By 1850, they had established their rule in most parts of India. Growing discontent among Indians the British did not want to leave any opportunity of making profit. They focused in the agricultural sector. They forced the farmers to grow cash crops like opium and indigo. These crops were then bought at a very low price by the British and sold in foreign lands at high prices. To make the matter even worse, the farmers had to pay huge taxes. As a result, the Indian farmers became very poor. The Indian handloom industry suffered the same fate as the agriculture. It was completely destroyed due to the corrupt policies of the British. Silk and cotton growers were forced to sell their products to the British at very low prices. These were then sent to Britain, where cloth was manufactured, and sent back to India for sale at high prices. This ruined the Indian textile industry. The Indian cotton growers and weavers became jobless. The Revolt of 1857 Almost every section of the Indian society was affected by the British policies. After the Indian rulers and farmers, the Indian soldiers in the British army also became discontented. They were paid much less as compared to the British soldiers. They were also denied higher posts which were only reserved for the British people. However, things became worse with the introduction of the Enfield rifle in the army. It was rumoured that the cartridges used in the rifles had casing coated with the fat of cows and pigs which had to be bitten off. This hurt the religious sentiments of both the Hindus and Muslims. The Indian soldiers refused to use these bullets and revolted against the British in 1857. This revolt of 1857 is also known as the First War of Independence. Mangal Pandey was the first soldier to protest. Soon, the other soldiers revolted. The revolt started in Meerut on 10th May 1857 and spread to Delhi, Kanpur, Lucknow, Jhansi, etc. The prominent leaders who led the revolt were Nana Sahib, Tantya Tope, Begum Hazrat Mahal, Rani Lakshmi Bai, etc. The farmers and workers too joined the revolt. The last Mughal emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar was declared the supreme leader by the soldiers. However, the British had a larger army and better weapons. 
they crushed the revolt. Many Indian leaders and soldiers were arrested and executed. Bahadur Shah Zafar was arrested and sent on exile to Burma. Now, Myanmar, result of the revolt of 1857. The Mughal rule came to an end. Some local rulers were allowed to rule their territories but were under the British control. The rule of the East India Company also ended. India came under the direct control of the British Crown and the British Parliament. The British government appointed a Governor-General to rule the country. He was also called the Viceroy. The first Viceroy of India was Lord Canning. The revolt laid down the foundation for the future freedom struggle and awakened the Indians. It inspired the Indians and soon the Indian independence movement started. Chapter 19 Freedom Movement of India Though the British had suppressed the revolt of 1857, the fire of discontentment was still burning in the hearts of native people. After the revolt, the British tried to bring some changes in the education system as well as transport and communication system. But the Indians were still dissatisfied. The educated Indians realized that the main reasons behind the disunity and backwardness in Indian society were the social evils like the caste system, killing of female babies, sati and child marriage. They thought that without the removal of these social evils, the state and fate of India could not be changed. The British had started Western education in India as to absorb educated Indians in the government offices on a meagre salary. However, the Western education also influenced Indians with Western thoughts. They formed associations, started newspapers and worked hard to awaken the feeling of patriotism amongst the Indians. All these efforts united the people against a common enemy. Many Indians rose to fight against injustice and bring reforms to Indian society. Social Reformers Some important reformers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, Swami Dayanand Saraswati and Swami Vivekanand led the information movement in India during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Raja Ram Mohan Roy is known as the father of modern India. He founded the Brahmo Samaj. He worked to put an end to cruel rituals and superstitions. As a result of Raja Ram Mohan Roy's efforts, the British government stopped the practice of sati. Dayanand Saraswati founded the Arya Samaj in 1875. He fought against child marriage. Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar got widow remarriage legalized. He gave importance to the education of girls and founded a number of schools, many of which were for girls. Swami Vivekanand travelled all over India teaching people to gain knowledge and do away with the caste system. Sayyid Ahmed Khan was another reformer of this period who gave much importance to spreading education amongst the masses. Indian National Congress After the spread of Western education, more and more people of India became aware of the injustices caused by the British. They felt the need for an organization which would help in educating the Indians about the policies of the British. As a result, the Indian National Congress was founded in 1885 by A. O. Hume. The first session of the Indian National Congress was held in Bombay, now Mumbai, in 1885. The president of the first session was Bomesh Chandra Bonerji. Some of the major leaders of the Congress were Dada Bhai Naoroji, Badruddin Tayyabji, 
फिरोज शाह मेहता सुरेंद्र नाथ बैनर्जी एंड गोपाल कृष्ण गोखले द इंडियन नेशनल कांग्रेस आज द ब्रिटिश गवर्नमेंट फॉर बेटर पॉलिसीज फॉर इंडियंस एम्प्लॉयमेंट फॉर इंडियंस इन गवर्नमेंट जॉब्स बेटर लिविंग कंडीशन फॉर इंडियंस द कांग्रेस लीडर्स ड्यूरिंग द अर्ली पीरियड अप्रोच द ब्रिटिश इन अ पीसफुल मैनर सो दीज लीडर्स व कॉल मॉडरेट्स रेडिकल्स देर केम अप अनदर ग्रुप ऑफ पेट्रियाटिक पीपल हु डिड नॉट अग्री विद द मेथड्स ऑफ पीसफुल रिक्वेस्ट मेड बाय द अदर कांग्रेस लीडर्स दिस ग्रुप ऑफ कांग्रेस लीडर्स इज कॉल्ड द रेडिकल्स The radicals wanted quick action. They wanted to strike and boycott the British government. Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Bipin Chandra Pal, and Lala Lajpat Rai were the important radical leaders. They are also famous as Lal Bal Pal. Tilak gave the famous slogans, "Swaraj is my birthright, and I shall have it." Partition of Bengal. The British were afraid of growing popularity of the Indian National Congress. As a result, the British adopted a divide and rule policy. The British government in 1905 divided Bengal into two parts, one for the Muslims and the other for the Hindus. This gave rise to mass protests across the country. people boycotted british goods and pledged to wear home spun cloth the congress launched the swadeshi movement against the partition there were huge bonfires of british goods the british tried to suppress the movement revolutionaries the revolutionaries were the leaders who believed that the british could be overthrown only by force they formed small secret groups and the members were trained to use arms bhagat singh chandrashekhar azad and khudiram bose were some such prominent revolutionaries gandhi ji in freedom movement with the involvement of mahatma gandhi in freedom movement the indian national congress got an amazing strength he taught the indians to fight the british using satyagraha and non violence gandhi ji returned to india from south africa in 1915 and led the freedom struggle for next 30 years in south africa gandhi ji fought against apartheid using non violence and satyagraha after coming to india he toured the length and breadth of the country and saw the condition of the people under gandhi ji millions of people from different sections of society joined the freedom movement peasants and other poor people also joined this movement gandhi ji also worked against caste system he tried to stop the practice of untouchability jallianwala bagh massacre The Jallianwala Bagh incident was the most heinous step taken by the British. On the 13th April 1919, many Indians assembled for a peaceful and unarmed political meeting to protest against the Rowlatt Act. At Jallianwala Bagh, a walled garden in Amritsar, General Dyer and his men fired bullets on the unarmed gathering. killing several innocent men and women this brutal incident shook the world khilafat movement the khilafat movement was started by the muslim leaders against the british government after the first world war the british tried to gain support of the muslims by promising them that the powers of sultan of turkey would not be taken away even after the war but the british did not keep their promise this angered the muslims and they started the movement in india too there were protests non cooperation movement 
Gandhiji started the non-cooperation movement against the British in 1921. He asked the people of India not to cooperate with the British government. People left their jobs, colleges and homes and joined the struggle and refused to cooperate with the government. Soon the jails were filled with prisoners. However, the protests grew violent and on one such occasion, an angry mob burnt down a police station at Chori Chora. This incident hurt Gandhiji as he wanted to attain freedom through non-violence. So he withdrew the movement. Chapter 20 Final Step to Freedom Though the Indian freedom fighters were divided into three sections as moderate, radical and revolutionary, they had the same motto of throwing the British out of India. In this long battle of freedom, many freedom fighters lost their lives. But the enthusiasm of the people increased day by day. More and more Indians began to support the freedom movement. Finally, the British decided to leave India. In this chapter, you will study about the last stage of freedom movement. Simon Commission The British wanted to make some changes in the way India was governed. In 1928, the British government appointed Simon Commission under the supervision of Sir John Simon to suggest some reforms in the working of the government of India. However, there was not a single Indian member in this commission. This angered the Indians greatly and they greeted the commission with black flags demonstration and the slogan, Simon, go back. In one such incident of boycott, Lala Lajpat Rai was injured by the British police and died. Involvement of New Leaders Many new leaders also got involved in the freedom movement of India, such as Dr. Rajendra Prasad, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, Abul Kalam Azad, Sarojni Naidu, Motilal Nehru, Govind Ballab Pant, and Jawaharlal Nehru. Civil Disobedience Movement After the boycott of the Simon Commission, the Congress decided to demand Swaraj or complete independence for India in 1928 at Lahore. Soon, Gandhiji started the civil disobedience movement in early 1930 with the Dandi March. Gandhiji, along with his followers, led a procession from his ashram in Ahmedabad to Dandi to break the salt law. The British had prevented Indians from making salt. People from all the parts of the country took active part in the movement. In the northwestern part of the country, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, popularly known as the Frontier Gandhi, led the movement. Quit India Movement The Congress under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi launched the Quit India Movement in August 1942. Gandhiji gave the famous cry, Do or Die. He appealed to the people to fight till the British left our country. The British tried to crush the movement. They arrested Gandhiji and other leaders. Subhash Chandra Bose Subhash Chandra Bose emerged as a powerful leader during this phase of the freedom movement. He formed the Indian National Army in 1941 to fight against the British. The Indian National Army also had a women's regiment known as the Rani Jhasi Regiment. Subhash Chandra Bose gave the call Jai Hind. India wins freedom. After the end of the Second World War in 1945, the British realized that they could no longer suppress the freedom movement. So, they agreed to leave India and transfer the power of government to the Indians. However, they also decided to divide the country into two parts, India and Pakistan. India became free on 15th August 1947. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru 
became the first Prime Minister of Independent India. Dr. Rajendra Prasad became the first President of our country. Chapter 21 Government India is the seventh largest country in the world. It is so huge that a single government cannot look after the entire country properly. So, we have two forms of governments. One at the centre, called the central government or union government, and the other at the state level, called the state government. In this chapter, you will study about these forms of governments as well as the judiciary system in India. The union government makes laws for the whole country and deals with issues of national importance. The state governments make laws for their respective states. At both the levels, the governments work together to make laws, implement them and do justice. Our country follows a democratic form of government. It is the rule of the people, for the people and by the people. The citizens of India have the freedom to elect their representatives who form governments at the central and state levels and run them for a fixed period of time, that is, five years. The representatives of the central government as well as the state governments are elected after every five years. These representatives belong to one of the political parties. Various political parties contest the elections. There are many political parties in India. The Indian National Congress and the Bharatiya Janta Party are the two major national parties. The Election Commission of India holds elections in the country. Union Government India has a parliamentary form of government. Our parliament consists of two houses, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. Lok Sabha The Lok Sabha is also known as the Lower House or the House of the People. At present, it has 545 members. Only Indian citizens of 25 years of age and above can become members of the Lok Sabha. These members are elected directly by the people of India. The term of the Lok Sabha members is five years. The members of the Lok Sabha elect a speaker who conducts the proceedings of the house. People of 18 years of age and above cast their vote for the candidate of their choice. The party that wins the maximum number of seats is invited by the President of India to form the government at the centre. The leader of the majority party becomes the Prime Minister. Rajya Sabha The Rajya Sabha is also known as the Upper House of the Parliament. Its members are not directly elected by the people of India. It can have a maximum of 250 members out of which 12 members who have excelled in the fields of literature, science, sports, arts and social service are chosen by the President. The remaining 238 members are elected by the members of the state legislative assemblies. The term of the Rajya Sabha members is six years. How a law is formed The major issues of the people are taken up in the parliament. The parliament discusses the issues and to solve such issues, it makes a draft. All discussions first take place in the Lok Sabha and then in the Rajya Sabha. When both the houses approve it, it becomes a law throughout the country. President The president is the head of our country. He or she is elected by the members of both the houses of the parliament and the state assemblies. The president is elected for five years. Prime Minister After the general elections held every five years, the party with majority forms the government. The Prime Minister is the leader of the party that forms the government. He or she is appointed by the President. He or she has a cabinet of ministers who carry out the task of running the government at the centre. State Government Each state has a legislative assembly. 
the members of the state legislative assemblies are elected by the people of the state. Each elected member is known as a member of legislative assembly or MLA. The elected MLAs form the government at the states. The state government is headed by the leader of the majority party. He is appointed the chief minister by the governor of the state. The chief minister and his council of ministers make laws for the state. The governor is the head of the state and is appointed by the president. Judiciary The main function of the judicial system in India is to ensure justice for all Indian citizens. The people who violate laws are tried on the court. The Supreme Court is the highest court of justice in India. It is located in New Delhi. It is headed by the Chief Justice who is appointed by the President. At the state level, there are high courts. There are also smaller courts such as session courts and district courts. Chapter 22 United Nations After the devastating effects of the Second World War, which occurred in 1939 and continued till 1945, the world leaders realized the need for an international organization to maintain peace in the world. As a result of their efforts, the United Nations was born on 24th October 1945. Let us know about this organization in detail. The UN has six principal organs, the General Assembly, Security Council, Economic and Social Council, Secretariat, International Court of Justice and United Nations Trusteeship Council. The UN has six official languages, Arabic, Chinese or Mandarin, English, French, Russian and Spanish. Formation of the UN After the First World War, many countries came together to form the League of Nations. The League failed completely to bring peace to the world, which led to the Second World War. The Second World War caused more destruction than the First World War. This brought many countries together to promote peace in the world. The name United Nations was given by the President of the USA, Franklin D. Roosevelt. 24th October is celebrated as the United Nations Day. Do you know? The headquarters of the UN are the New York City and its regional headquarters are in Geneva, Vienna and Nairobi. Principles of the UN The UN Charter was based on the following principles. There should be mutual respect for each other among all the nations. The members of the UN should not use threats and force. The members should settle disputes by peaceful means. The members should support the UN and all its activities. Objective of the UN To maintain international peace and security. To settle disputes between member states peacefully. To develop friendly relations among nations. To ensure equal rights for all nations. To promote respect for human rights and freedom for all to solve economic, social and cultural problems amicably. Main Organs of the UN The General Assembly The General Assembly is the main organ of the UN. Each member country has only one vote in the Assembly. It works like a parliament where all the issues related to world peace are discussed. The General Assembly meets once in a year between September and December. Security Council The Security Council is responsible for maintaining international peace in the world. It has 15 members, 5 of them are permanent and the rest 10 are elected for a two-year term. The five permanent members are the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia and China. The Secretariat the Secretariat prepares reports, keeps records and carries out the day-to-day -day activities of the UN. The head of the Secretariat is the Secretary General, the Economic and the Social Council. The Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, works under the General Assembly. It aims at improving the living conditions of the people all over the world. It protects human rights. It sends food, clothing and other essential commodities to the needy and to those affected by natural calamities. The International Court of Justice 
The International Court of Justice is also called the World Court. Its headquarters are at The Hague in the Netherlands. This court settles international disputes between nations in a peaceful manner. The International Council of Justice has 15 judges for a term of 9 years. The Trusteeship Council. This organ was established to look into the transition of colonies to independence. This organ is now dissolved as its goal has already been achieved. Agencies of the United Nations. Much of the work of the UN is carried out by certain agencies. They deal with food, health, education, environment and agriculture. Some of these agencies are mentioned below. The United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, UNICEF. It helps to control the spread of diseases and provides healthy food to the undernourished and malnourished children. The Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO. It works towards raising the level of nutrition and standards of living. To improve agricultural productivity and fight hunger, it educates the farmers in better methods of farming and pest control. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. It promotes international cooperation in education, science and culture. It protects human rights. The International Labour Organization, I. This agency works to improve the condition of the laborers all over the world. The World Health Organization, WHO. It works to improve the health of the people. This agency provides free medical aid and takes measures to check the spread of infectious diseases like malaria and polio. Achievements of the UN. The UN has successfully mediated between nations to prevent war and conflicts. The UN's role in controlling the spread of arms is important. The UN has been successful in helping the developing countries to fight against poverty, disease and illiteracy. The UN has been successful in improving cultural cooperation among the nations. The UN has achieved remarkable success in providing relief to the refugees and the victims of natural calamities and man-made disasters. India and the United Nations India has been a member of the United Nations since its formation in 1945. It actively participates in all the activities of the UN. India is an active participant in the various programs conducted by several UN agencies like UNESCO, WHO, FAO and ILO. Many Indian experts work for these UN agencies. Similarly, many UN experts help us to solve our problems. The WHO has helped India fight diseases and prevent epidemics. The FAO has improved agricultural practices in India by providing better quality seeds, pesticides and fertilizers.